Vibrant Life, episode 39. I'm Jessica Parker. I'm a holistic health coach with a master's in health psychology and I'm a fitness instructor. So today is Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. We're going to chat about five things to consider when it comes to the plant-based push and then underneath that, the case for better meat rather than no meat. So I have five things to talk about, but before I go into that, I just want to preface this by saying I have done a couple of other episodes where I really go in a little deeper into my story, but I was vegetarian for several years back in my like late teens into twenties. And, um, that was well before I really understood health and well before I understood how to research. And it was just kind of what was going on at the time. What was kind of trendy. I was also part of the whole low fat craze. So I would eat like a pizza with, you know, no meat on it. I don't want any cheese on it because that's fattening. I want just the crust and the sauce and lots of veggies. <laughs> that's the kind of thing that I would do when I'd go out with friends. So anyway, I had blood sugar issues and could never donate blood because I was always borderline anemic and didn't have a lot of muscle tone. I couldn't understand why, but that's for a whole nother Dr. Phil show, right? But I just want to mention that because I get it. I get it. And I'm not trying to pick on anyone here. I'm really interested in kind of pulling out the facts and the science and the actual research instead of, you know, there's just so, so many opinions and emotion out there when it comes to something like this. It's a very heated topic, right? But I have been a little bit disturbed by how much it's being pushed and then how little, you know, true information is out there. That's why I wanted to really talk about it. So, um, Again, I go into this in other past episodes, but what kind of got me out of the vegetarian lifestyle, I wasn't vegan, I was vegetarian, was when I went to Alaska. And I really thought meat is bad. I just, you know, associated it with, you know, processed, fast food, all the things. And I didn't grow up in a family that hunted or fished or anything like that. But when I went up to Alaska, it was all around me. And my first winter experience was two weeks up in Kotzebue, way in the middle of nowhere, like absolute nowhere, 30 miles away from the closest like quote town, which was not even, I mean, it was a village. It was tiny. And I didn't have the option of, you know, my veggies and fresh, fresh fruit and all that kind of stuff. I, I literally did not have that option. And so my first meal there was moose. It was very, very good, but it was definitely, you know, I had prepped myself mentally. I knew, I knew, but you know, I went out side with the, the mom and this, this short, stocky, just all muscle woman. I mean, she was like maybe five feet tall, all muscle. I mean, she, that, that gal had like an eight pack. I mean, she was strong and, um, when we were deciding what to have for dinner, she took me outside and there was a mound of snow and she uncovered it and, or part of it and sawed off a piece of mousse and we went in and she cooked it. And so I was like, okay, we're doing this. So, so that was my reintroduction to me, but I really saw this whole huge cultural shift and, you know, the people there were so thankful for what they had and lives were so much more simple and it was more, you know, sustainable living completely different than down here where it's like Starbucks and Burger King and McDonald's and all that crap, you know, um, processed everything. So that really kind of got my wheels turning. So let's dive in. The first thing, um, that I wanted to, to talk about is just that difference between, you know, like the sustainable, humanely raised meat and then factory and processed. And when you look at information out there, usually people are trying to vilify meat. And so they use facts and figures and scenarios and pictures and all the thing, all the, all the things from the factory farms, from those, you know, horrible places. I don't agree with them at all, at all. In fact, that's one thing that I really learned was, oh my gosh, you know, the things that happen there, but then it doesn't have to. 
um, there are more and more small sustainable farms and ranches every day. And I think that is a beautiful thing. So we have to get rid of that perspective. We have to use our own brains instead of the things people are telling us and just want us to believe and realize, okay, there's a variation. So understand that. And when you're looking at information, you need to understand, okay, what are they talking about here? And are they having a biased perspective? Are they trying to get me to believe a certain thing? Like, is it true? You need to think for yourselves. It's allowed. It is. <laughs> um, I laugh because it's like, is it? It is. You just have to do it. So I would also argue though, that people have a disconnect with their food and how it's made even in the plant-based world. There's this Beyond Burger crap. I mean, sorry, but chemical shitstorm, right? I've looked at the ingredients. Holy crap, I wouldn't put that in my body. Um, there, and then, and then just even like, you know, almond milk and oat milk, and I have some of that stuff sometimes. But you know, I don't think people understand the process in which things are made. And there's this argument, you know, about the environment. Well, what about? The manufacturing and what about harvesting these plant foods and what that might do to the soil and the wildlife there even if they're small they're still animals so there are certain things that are just not being factored into the whole equation and that's where i'm i'm just asking that people do that that you don't just spew out these you know talking points and this emotional, dramatic, you know, whatever, and say, you must do it my way, but stop for a minute and like, look at the bigger picture. And is this really the answer? Is everybody going plant-based really the answer? So moving on, number, the second thing is a really, it's kind of a tough one. It's death. I mean, and that is just part of life. I think that a lot of us don't really know how to handle it or navigate that whole thing, but it's there. And with the whole animal-based eating, that's something that, again, gets very vilified and it can because it's more out in the open. It's more obvious, right? But animals and life are harmed and killed in the process of growing and harvesting plant food as well. And I would argue possibly even more when you consider something like a cow on a small farm or a ranch, you know, versus crops. The harvesting, the plowing, animals are killed in that process and people don't wanna talk about it. Or what about certain habitat, you know, habitats that are, that are ruined? Um, and then I also have to take it a step further because some of this like lab grown meat and garbage like that, what is that doing to the environment in terms of factories and manufacturing. And I'm sorry, but I always get a, a image of Bill G-A-T-E-S. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> and he, the man has moves. Okay. So I don't believe that somebody who is like, quote, elite like that is eating the way he's telling everybody else to eat. I'm sorry. I have a very negative perspective of the man. He wants to dictate and control. Um, I would argue that he probably just drinks a lot or something like that. And that's why he, he's probably estrogen dominant, dominant and has the moves, you know, um, but he's probably eating plenty of meat, but these people can make money off of us. So more on that in a little bit back to this whole thing though, with animals and the whole idea of death. So raising animals humanely it actually gives them a comfortable and happy life that they might not have in the wild. I think we have this, I was going to say like Disney perspective, but that's not necessarily true when you think of some of the movies, you know, like even Bambi. But um, <clears throat> I think we have a fairy tale idea of what death might look like for these animals out in the wild. Oh, they just die peacefully of old age. And that's not true. And this is, here's another example from when I lived in Alaska. I worked for Denali National Park. I was the headquarters receptionist. And there was a time, it was, oh man, I hated this, where we were getting all these calls for visitors because if you've never been to Denali, please go. It's amazing. But there's one road into the park 
and you just, you know, go in, it's like 90 miles and then go out. Some people, you know, go partway in or whatever, but there's that one road and it's a national park, you know, so you can't just go and do whatever you want in there. Well, there's a hands-off policy with the animals. So it's basically, we're trying to protect and preserve their habitats and their lives while still kind of being amongst them in a way, you know, it's the only national park that's still patrolled by dog sled, by the way, little side note. But there, there was a time when there was a baby moose, I'm, I'm trying to remember, it's been a few years, a baby moose that was surrounded by a wolf pack. And it was in a very like shallow stream. And they were basically like, this was over the course of days, like basically tormenting it and like, you know, just had it encircled. This is horrible. I'm, I apologize, but it's tr it, this is what happens. These are the things that happen that we don't think about, you know? And, you know, I'm sitting here sick to death about it. And like, somebody just go rescue it. And they're like, we have a hands-off policy. And so people would call angry because they're going into the park on these tour buses and they're seeing this. And I'm like, uh, gosh, how old was I? 19, 20? Anyway, that was not a <laughs> cool situation to be in. But but the point is, it's like you can't have hands-off policy over here, but not over here. And that was, you know, like if you're going to practice that, it has to be in all areas. And that is the circle of life. So that was just a huge wake-up call for me. It's not something that I really pondered a lot, mostly because I really didn't want to think about it. But in years going past that, I have thought about it, you know. And that is, that's something that people just don't want to admit happens. And so these animals that are raised these on these, you know, happy farms with people that truly love them and are thankful for them, um, have a completely different outcome in life. They're protected, right? So it also, again, with a, a hard topic, but when they are killed at the end of their lives, these farms are very purposeful in doing it in a way that again is humane and they don't even know it. They don't even know it happens, you know, like there's no, um, there's no need to have fear because it just happens and they don't even see it coming essentially. So again, it's a very tough topic, but it is what happens on this earth and um, something that, you know, I find more comfortable navigating in that aspect. So moving on, number three, so the whole climate change thing, you know, it's, it's a big thing with, you know, cattle and they fart and blah, 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 whatever with the methane. So I'm going to bring up, um, I have a whole list of people to mention at the end that um, have kind of mentored me um, virtually, like they don't even know it, right? But um, here's one book that I'm in the middle of reading, Sacred Cow, Diana Rogers and Rob Wolf. I've followed Rob Wolf for, for years and Diana Rogers kind of more recently because of this project actually. But I would highly recommend buying this book. There's also a movie. I've not actually watched the movie because I want to um, finish reading the book first. But talk about detail and research and science and diving into facts. I mean, that's one thing, one reason I've always really loved Rob Wolf's work is because the man's a genius and I love to nerd out on health and he's somebody where it's like, oh my gosh, I have to reread that or rewind and listen again because it's like, you know, it, it can be hard to kind of process all of it, but that's what I love. I am not somebody who's just going to hear these little talking points. Okay, let's go with that. No, I want facts and I want research. And sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we're wrong and we have to admit that. I don't see a lot of that going on in the world right now. But um, this book really dives in to that whole thing with climate change. It dives into all of this that I'm talking about, but it really dives into it greatly. Um, so... I'm just going to touch on this because it's a huge, very complicated topic. Get the book. So the first thing is that cows, they, they're not actually farting methane. They're belching it. They're burping it up while they're digesting. And 
the story we're told is that they're worse than vehicles when it comes to greenhouse gases and its impact on climate change. But this book, again, goes um, deep into that. So there's three main greenhouse gases when it comes to agriculture. There's CO2 um, from plowing, cutting trees, burning fossil fuels, and it's active. The CO2 is active for thousands of years. Methane is primarily from rice and then belching cows and active for about 10 years. Nitrous oxide is the third one and it's from the use of fertilizers and it's active for about 100 years. So those are the three. So methane, the big baddie, right? So methane is part of a natural life cycle and system. It's part of a natural life cycle and system. Let me say that again, because of this, there are no net inputs, especially because it comes from living organisms, which is different from fossil fuels. So um, in Sacred Cow, page 135, Christine Page of Smiling Tree Farm in Britain breaks this down and there's a little, there's a little graphic there as well that can kind of help because this can be kind of difficult to digest. So cattle break down existing carbon in grass and other things like grass that they're eating and digesting. And as they digest, it turns into methane. Methane exists for about 10 years, like I said before, and then is broken back down into water and carbon dioxide molecules, which with more water is cycled back into more grass and then the whole thing starts again. It's the whole cycle, right, of life. So a recent NASA study, just have to end with this, found that most methane is from fossil fuels, fires, and wetlands, or rice farming. Did you hear me say cows? No. So again, I just have to point this out again, that this is a natural cycle. This is a natural part of life, this whole system with the methane and kind of recycling, you know? So it's really, really being vilified and it kind of doesn't make any sense when you actually dive deep into what's going on, hashtag science. So number four, the land and water argument. So cattle, um, you know, people talk about, well, you know, they take up so much land. We don't have enough land. We could use that for plants. Well, actually, cattle can live and be raised on land that cannot be inhabited by plant life. More than 60% of agriculture land around the world is pasture and range land that is actually too rocky, steep, or arid for plant agriculture. However, cattle can thrive on this land. Hmm. The claim that cattle take up such an abundance of water is false. So the water argument, that's one that you hear all the time. You have to, again, dive a little deeper. The kind of water is very important here. Where the water comes from is critical and it's a huge missing piece of the story. So there's green water and that's, you know, the precipitation that just falls to the earth, gets soaked into the soil or it lands on the plants. The plants use it, you know, it's just hanging out um, but then there's the blue water, which is what you typically think of when you think of water, the fresh water and the streams and rivers and aquifers. Um, and I just, you know, I, I have a bunny that runs around in my backyard. He's like, he's a pet. I had two and um, they couldn't, they can't get out because, you know, it's fenced in and blocked off. And so I would alternate. They couldn't, they didn't get along. So they couldn't like be out together, but I would alternate. One would have a day out. And then I would switch and now one of them passed away. And so the bunny that I have now, his name's August, he just lives in the backyard. His little, his little uh, house, his little hutch is there and open, but he doesn't even like going in it. He would prefer to run around, eat the grass. Um, he goes under the deck, you know, when it's rainy, he doesn't like going in his little hutch. Anyway, I do put water out for him because you know, I have cats and I have a dog and you just give pets water, right? But I never see him drink it. Like he's getting water from the grass and he's getting water from the rain. And, you know, he's living kind of more, a, more of a natural life now. And that's the same with this situation. Like the water that I give him is the blue water. The green water is what he's actually thriving off of. So um, with cattle, 92% and it's actually higher, more like 98% in grass-finished beef. There's grass-fed, 
and finished or grass fed and grain finished. We'll talk about that another time, but um, it's 92% or higher. Um, the water that cattle is utilized is green water. 92% of the water that ca cattle utilize is green water. So it would, the green water would have been there regardless of the cattle. So you're not like, you know, bringing in water from, you know, wherever it's water that has landed from precipitation and they're utilizing it as they're eating the grass. Um, obviously feedlot cows, different story. They use blue water. We're, t we're not talking about feedlot cows. That's not what we're talking about. Um, and then with grass fed, pasture raised cattle, about 30% of the water that they consume is actually returned to the ecosystem through urine and manure, um, which adds to the nutrient density of the soil, which is a whole nother topic. I'm not going to talk about it today because it's huge, but just, you know, I'm just going to say really quick, there's, there's um, this whole, you know, when we're growing plants and we're, we're extracting nutrients from the soil constantly, constantly, constantly. And there's actually a pretty big issue with soil that people are not talking about enough. Um, we are stripping the nutrients from soil and not putting it back. And so that's where sustainable and regenerative farming comes in. And, um, animals are a huge piece of restoring soil health. So, um, and just a little side note, uh, on page 175, you can see information about this, but a pound of rice takes 410 gallons of water produ to produce and avocados, wal walnuts, and sugar are similar to that. So side note, number five, this whole idea where we all have to be plant-based, like the, the mayor in New York is having school children, it's I think Monday is Meatless Monday now, and Friday is, it's something, it's some other cute name, right? But um, basically they're not having meat. One of them might be vegan, I don't even know, but they're not having meat on Mondays or Fridays now. And, you know, there's a, a deep concern that people are voicing because there are certain areas in New York where, you know, there are, are larger poverty levels, and some of these kids, might go home and not have high quality food. And meat provides such a huge source of, you know, needed, necessary amino acids and protein. And here you're like sending the kids off on a Friday. Nope, you're not gonna have anything real sustainable for your system. And go all weekend, probably having crap, maybe not having enough. Coming back Monday, you're gonna have another meatless, whatever, you know. I have an issue with that. I have an issue with that. It's a concern. And so I really do feel like this, it's part of creating this whole haves and have nots thing going on. Kind of like with um, Pete, what's his name? Buttigieg or whatever, however you say his name, the transportation secretary, I believe is his title saying, oh, gas prices are high. Just go buy an electric vehicle. Well, I'm sorry, but not everybody can just go buy an electric vehicle. I don't personally want one. I don't believe that um, they're truly as green as they tell us they are from, in, from research that I've done. But aside from that, that's not a realistic solution. Just go buy an electric vehicle. You know, it's the same type of thing with a vegetarian or vegan diet if you're gonna do it correctly you have to be very purposeful about your nutrients you have to be very calculated in the nutrients you're getting and again i was one and you have to rely on supplements you have to it has to involve supplements because there are certain things that you cannot get from plants that your body needs in order to thrive and we don't want to just survive, we want to thrive. So I would argue that those in the elite positions pushing for less meat are, are actually profiting off of this whole thing, this whole culture, cultural shift they're, pro, they're trying to implement. So um, with that in mind, developing cultures can't do that. It's, I mean, it's just asinine to me. This is opinion and this is based off of observation, but 
people in my life, whether they have been clients or friends or relatives that have, you know, really subsisted on plant-based have struggled and I have deep concerns about it. This whole plant-based thing is so far off from what our traditional culture was ever like. And I have a problem with that, but I mostly have a problem with people telling me what to do, especially when the science doesn't actually back it up. So I would love going back to what this is all about, to have a conversation about doing things better and not just cutting things off. So last thing I want to say is I want to share a scripture verse because I find it quite interesting. I do believe that we are in a whole spiritual shift and a spiritual battle. First Timothy one through four, it talks about this, that this would happen, that people would be telling you what to do, how to eat. First Timothy one through four, the spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to, to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. So I'm not trying to push my faith on anyone, but these are things that we've been told would be happening at this time in life. So um, be careful who you listen to and think for yourself. That's the last thing I will say. That is all I have. Um, I will be talking about this a lot more because I there's so much to say about it, so much to learn about it. There's gobs of information out there. And I did mention that I was going to tell you a few people that I I follow that have helped me because... I mean, you could spend hours and hours and hours researching, you know, so a lot of these people, they bring the research to you. You can look at the, the information they share. You can go and look at it. Don't ever take what somebody says, like, just never take their word. Go research it and figure it out for yourself. Rob Wolf is one I already shared. Diana Rogers. Um, uh, Allie Miller is one of my favorites. Chris Kresser. These, these are people I've followed for a long time. Paul Saladino, Dave Asprey, and then Dr. Brett Schur. I'm not sure <laughs> sure if that's if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but he is part of the Diet Doctor podcast. I've been following him on YouTube for a while, and um, I will link to it, but there there's um, one that I just listened to today, the the original environmentalist. It's very good, very interesting. And he talks to three different ranchers and farmers. And um, these people are amazing. And it really like makes me want to learn more about how to help our environment through agriculture and doing it the right way. All right, you guys, you can find me at thatvibrantlife.com, Facebook, That Vibrant Life, and Instagram, that underscore vibrant life. Thank you.